film was announced recently that the Duffa Brothers are forming a new production company which will develop shows for Netflix. And of course, live-action adaptations of anime is still on the table. Death Note is the one that was specified by the Netflix Twitter account. And I can see the disgust now. I assure you I am making the same face off stage. Some of you probably are thinking about the failed live-action anime adaptations from before. Ahem, Dragon Ball Evolution. Many of you are also thinking about other failed endeavors of animation to live-action adaptations, such as, you guessed it, The Last Airbender. <sighs> Don't get me started ranting about that movie. I'll never stop. We've had some controversial live-action anime adaptations. Ghost in a Shell, the Netflix Death Note, Speed Racer, which is actually pretty funny if you watch it for just the so-bad-it's-good value alone. Let's examine the art of why everything falls apart. What exactly makes these adaptations fail? Let's get the fundamentals out of the way first. People have different levels of tolerance for what you can do in one medium versus another. While you can get away with a book, you can't really do the same with an audiovisual medium like a film. When the big bad is monologuing his plot in the book and his backstory, we, the audience, can find it a bit more acceptable. When he is doing so in a film, TV show, or a theater production, better get out the backstory flashback, or you're going to bring out the musical number since I did mention theater. The dissonance goes both ways. You can have a massacre sequence in a film go quickly like what Vader does to the Separatist Council. Not so much in the novelization, which is why Matt Stover decided to take some liberties, such as Separatist leaders begging for mercy and getting snark in return. It's not what you don't change which makes or breaks an adaptation. We've had what amounted to shot-for-shot -shot remakes of films before that, and shot-for-shot -shot remakes still suck. It's what you do change that makes all the difference. I don't think anything highlights this more than the live-action adaptation of The Lion King. It's technically a photorealistic animation, but the live-action is what they were trying to emulate, so therefore I will be treating it as such. One of the great benefits of animation is ascribing human qualities to non-humans, be it robots or animals. You can read the annoyance in Zasu's face and the embarrassment in Simba's with this line right here. Same line in the live-action, much worse staging, and clearly you can't read emotions. Or this line, you can see the amusement in everyone but Zazu and the rhino's face. When the same line is given in the live action, you demonstrate the limits of realism in the expression. One of the principles of animation is exaggeration, as perfect imitations of reality can be very static and dull. Most people immediately jump to the facial gags and the uh, chibi gags in anime, but those are an exaggeration, and so are the more subtle exaggerations, as much as that sounds contradictory. No matter how subtle it is, it's still an exaggeration of reality. The eyes themselves convey a lot with a human face. Innocence, bloodlust, really murderous intent beyond the normal bloodlust. I say when you take away one element of the original in an adaptation, you must somehow fill that void. And that void is not filled well. A book to film is relatively easy to do. You have the cinematography, you have the soundtrack, you have the set pieces, you have the visuals, which I'm just sure the special effect teams are probably setting fire to their computers with how much they're rendering. When adapting a work from one audiovisual medium to another audiovisual medium, especially when the original work's biggest appeal is the breathtaking animation, you're going to need to fill that void. Lest your adaptation turn out to be nothing more than a pale imitation of the original at best, or an unintentional parody at worst. It's probably why Ghost in the Shell rubbed me the wrong way. There were moments where I did feel it was like a pale imitation of the original from just the visuals trying to replicate certain iconic scenes, I guess, alone. It doesn't work because it does feel like a pale imitation of the original. Or you run into the other issue where you run high concepts of works into the ground. Not all works lend themselves well to getting easily adapted into live action in the first place. Need I remind everyone that our first foray into Doctor Strange and the madness that is the magical realms of Marvel was a 93 minutes of ugh. 
While attempting to go for My Hero Academia, Demon Slayer, Black Clover, and many other shonen with established fan bases, I'm just going to have to turn my head when it comes to live-action adaptations. Our tolerance for the zany is a bit higher in animation than it is for live-action. We can accept the weird hair, we can accept the overdramatic clothes and proportions in anime, and well, in this case, video games, as all these examples come from Square Enix. Not so much in live-action, where live-action designs of animated characters could easily come off as bad cosplay. And it's more than a budget issue. The budget is merely a tool. If your art direction for your adaptation is bad, then throwing money at it won't help by that much. Filling a void left by animation is not an easy task, and one I cannot overstate. Either you end up with a shot-for-shot -shot remake, which is only annoying to the fans and a pale imitation of the original, with the few differences that it makes, or you go off the rails from the source material and the fans don't want to see it and ultimately just looks cheap. If I'm ever anticipating a live-action adaptation of an animated property without a hint of hesitation, then you probably know that I'm not the real serial. And with that, I'm out. <laughs>